So glad you came. Thank you for coming. Sherry, uh, you had some things to present, I think. Isn't that right? Let's do that. No, they're not going to starve in Oklahoma. Not at the Nazarene Church, let me tell you. <laughs> David and Naomi Phillips. Naoma Phillips. Get it right. And uh, we've known them for a long time. Um, and uh, it was fun getting to talk a little bit this afternoon and catching up a little bit. But he didn't tell us too much yet about what they're doing on the mission field. So we're going to get the same treat that you are in their presentation. And uh, nobody wants to sing anything, so Dave, I guess we're going to turn it over to you and Naomi. And, and, uh, and if you don't want to be, you got a handout. Okay. okay. So how, how many of you guys like to be up front speaking? You enjoy that? No. So Naomi's with you. Okay. <laughs> <She's>, <laughs> she, she loves talking to people, but being up front speaking. It's, I don't think it's muted. I just am not being, being the right voice I should be. Okay, so um, tonight, since we have some young ones with us, we're going to start with our little Sunday school video. Have you ever seen an elephant? Have you ever seen an elephant paint a picture? Okay. You haven't seen an elephant paint a picture? Okay, so we're going to see that. And uh, I shot all this video myself, so this is authentic, actual. Uh, it happened that way, so... If you could roll that first video for us, David. First video, please. behind each other, line by line, their ears are swinging out. Uh, they cool off their body with their ears, not sweat. And so when the sunlight's striking through that ear, you see the red from the, all the blood vessels pouring through that thing. So we watched them paint actually more than one, uh, and they had a whole slew of these for sale. And for whatever reason, we didn't end up buying one of these as some of the stuff we're bringing home. But Liam and I um, pastured here in Texas Texas, my goodness gracious. <laughs> uh, I'll ask your forgiveness right now because uh, I'll use the excuse. I had, I had cancer, they gave me chemotherapy, and ever since then, my brain has not been the same. <laughs> we pastored here in Oklahoma in Fairfax uh, for two years from 94 and 95. And then in Texas uh, from 96 and 97, 1998, the church sent us to the Philippines. That was our first assignment, was to go to 
Manila, Philippines, and then uh, I began to work with my boss and travel around the Philippines. And two years later, I became the field director. I changed the name of it later, the field strategy coordinator for the Philippines. So this this uh, young pastor, I was 35 years old, that had always pastored churches that were small, always been bivocational, and I was suddenly in charge of 200 churches, 11 districts, and two Bible colleges, and on the board of a seminary. And I was scared spitless. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, it was, it was the scariest thing I have ever had happen to me in my life. And what to do with this thing? When I asked my regional director who appointed me to the position, and I said, well, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> you know? And he said, grow the church. That was his full range of instructions. Grow the church, you know, and let me have at it. And the Lord helped us. Uh, I've said this before, but I'll say it right to start here. When we're working on these kind of things, I, my feeling is that, that like I was when a kid, my dad would be building something and adding an addition to the house, and I was the little three-year-old kid with the plastic hammer, you know, pounding on the little things. And, and God lets us do those things, you know. We're, we're the ones that are pounding the plastic hammer while he builds his church. So you know, that's my view of everything tonight, and we're talking here. <laughs> If we did anything at all, we pounded on the plastic hammer while Jesus did the work and uh, helped to correct us and change us. So uh, we spent 12 years in the Philippines total. The Lord grew his church from 200 churches to 350 churches. And uh, we were able to turn over the leadership that we had to a local individual and came home in 20, 2010. And... Uh, the Lord took us on a, a twisty path then, and a year and a half later, the church asked us to go back in the mission service. We didn't think we were, and they sent us to Southeast Asia. The Philippines is a Roman Catholic country. Uh, 89, 90% of the Filipinos are Roman Catholic. So working in the Philippines was a basically Christian environment, uh, uh, quite a bit different. If you've... I, it's a lot different. The Roman Catholicism in the Philippines is very, very different from the Roman Catholicism in the United States. And I don't have time to explain all those differences, but I'll tell you one little story. Uh, one Easter weekend, Neom and I were taking a fast trip because no one else was driving. And so we were driving out of Manila and up north to visit some missionary friends. And on our way, as we're driving through a small town, we saw 50 men who were hunched over and beating themselves barebacked with, with uh, whips and uh, doing a small dance in this thing because they were trying to make themselves acceptable to God by beating themselves. Um, wow. But that kind of a theme that I can, I can make myself good for God uh, that's been something that we found was true even with the Buddhists. So we, we landed in Southeast Asia in the summer of 2012. And all of Southeast Asia, we were responsible for five countries. In the Philippines, I was responsible for the whole Philippines, 7,000 islands, 11 districts, up to three, over 300 churches, and also Micronesian islands. So we got to travel out through Guam, Ponape, Chuuk, um, and Saipan and some of those islands out that way, way out in the Pacific. And so we get to, the, we get to Southeast Asia, it's all Buddhism. And Pumpuro, uh, Pumput Pasatai Nitnoi. I can just speak a teeny tiny bit of Thai after three years of study, <laughs> 300 hours or 400 hours of study, I can speak and you know, I can tell you my name. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible, it's terrible. I'd like to run a second video. And I'll tell you a little bit about this. This is, you can turn that volume down. There's been, uh, uh, this is in Ho Chi Minh City. I'm riding on this motorcycle. I'm holding my iPhone on the back of your missionary, who's about 65 years old at this point, and he's driving his motorcycle through this. Do 
watch carefully here, you'll see that it's exactly yeah. like uh, Vanessa, Oklahoma. You see how there's no accidents yet either. Yeah, just like Route 66. There you go. This is Bangkok, Thailand. And they sell most Thai eat food from the street. They don't eat in the home. And having a motorcycle down on the street is common being. This next scene here is in Myanmar, in northern Myanmar. Yes, this is uh, about eight years ago. J.K. Ward, I don't know if you've ever seen him or not. Uh, exactly it was his first day. time to ride a bike like this. I don't know. In his whole life. And he retired the next year. I'm not sure if that encouraged him or not. Uh, yeah, I felt really sorry for this young man. This is a, <laughs> this is a deal. He is a, you know, a few pounds lighter than I was. This is over, this is over in Myanmar, but now we're up Here's anybody hearing some cow stomach? No. Okay. But this is a breakfast I really like. And this is one after he finishes getting his ball fixed up. He'll, he'll roll that and slide it. You can see he's got some over here with him. And then after he slides it out, he'll deep fry it and then pour a sweet corn sauce over his thing. And then he'll stop the egg or deep fried egg on top of that. And then you get cup of coffee, which is a one-third sweet condensed milk, and then the other top, two-thirds, is really black coffee, which tastes black, and it's pretty well up. Now, that'll be the one. It's not so bad. So this is at a hotel in Yangon, and we've moved over here. Oh. Thailand to a little place called Mahasar Comp. Jesus yeah, said that yeah, when you enter into a house, the whatever they eat, <laughs> eat, eat, right? <laughs> so they were feeding me pickled frog meat. Hot, spicy pickled frog meat. So there you go. Um, anybody here had hot, spicy pickled frog meat? No. Okay. You want some? No. You don't want some. Okay. <laughs> oh, man. And we've got the So coming to Southeast Asia, it was really a challenge. It's one of the most unreached places in the world. Now, I, I hear, and since the time I came to Jesus, um, everybody in the world is talking about, well, Jesus is coming back. Jesus is coming back. You know? Is it a pre-tribulation rapture? Is it a, is it a post-tribulation rapture? Are we going to go through all this stuff or not? You know? And it's all excitement. I, I want to give you a little bit of missionary second coming for just a moment. And this comes out of of 2 Peter chapter 3. The whole chapter in 2 Peter talks about Jesus coming again. And that's a verse where it says, God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that everyone would come to repentance. He is not slow, as some people count slowness. He is patient. What he's waiting for why don't we have the second coming yet? Because, folks, there's still places like Southeast Asia where you have a country like Thailand that has 0.7% Christian, where you can drive through whole provinces and never meet a Christian the whole time you're walking through. Yeah. It's an amazing thing. Talk about needing the gospel, needing good news. And so I'd like to try to share that. And while I'm talking some tonight, I'm going to give you a little bit more than what I normally do. And we're going to ask Dave from time to time. We're going to pause it and the recording that they're doing. So I can share some stuff with you that I normally don't get to share if they're, folk, if they're doing it live in these things. So, yeah, let's see here. Up or down? Down. Okay, down. So a field strategy coordinator, that's been my title. And let me tell you what that means. Basically, it means that um, you guys give all this money. You give to world evangelism. Uh, you give to Alabaster. You give to Compassionate Ministries. Uh, you send work and witness teams. 
uh, somebody says, oh, we have this special thing, we want to get a project done, and all that money goes somewhere, and somebody has to decide what to do with it, and that was my job. <laughs> my job was to take the offerings you give and do something that really helps the church in that area. It was to take the people that you send, and we've had a lot of missionaries. We've got a, a missionary family that's, that's now back in Oklahoma because of this uh, virus situation that we're in. But they were stationed in one of our countries in Southeast Asia. So when you send us a missionary, we try to put them in the right place, and in the place where they can go. And when you're praying for us, it helps a lot. It really helps a lot. So, great. Uh, Pra Thailand. Neil and I were there. Uh, this picture is taken about two years ago, and that's one of the really unreached areas in all of Thailand. And there's a lady there, and she's still friends with us, and she sends me, you know, uh, five or six things a day on Facebook or another media thing we have. She's really eager to start a church, and so far we haven't been able to do it. But, but we've got Nazarenes in these areas. It's a long way, folks. It's literally Monday morning at this time of day in Thailand right now. It's 12 hours. It's literally halfway around the world. So uh, it's, a, it's a deal in terms of just traveling to get there from just to get to the area is a 36-hour trip. Okay. So when we do get there, we lived in this little town called Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 12 million people. And so it's like it took it's like you took half of Texas and stuck them in Dallas. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it was huge. And yet, uh, we enjoyed it. We had a little apartment there. I was talking about some of the languages. Uh, any guesses as to what these are? What's that? Oh, no. It's John, the, it's John 3.16 in both sides here. And on this side over here is the Thai language. And on this side is Burmese. So normally when a person is trying to learn these things, we give them two years of full-time study. And um, they get up to just about, you know, the level of a one- or two-year-old being able to speak in that amount of time. These are difficult languages to learn. Okay, so Buddhism is our context in Southeast Asia. This little... This little tiny pagoda is, is 130 feet tall. What you're looking at is pure gold, 50 tons of pure gold, given by some of the poorest people in the world because they believe that if they give money to a temple, that it will help to remove their karma. Folks, when people are in pain or feel guilty or are oppressed, they spend big bucks to try to remove that in their lives. And it's a really big deal. Let me give you, as we walk through this, a little bit of the feel for what the Buddhists are thinking about. Anybody here read the book of Job? You read the book of Job? You know Job's friends? Yeah, really good friends, right? <laughs> Yeah, you remember Job's friends. Their message to him was, the reason that you're suffering is because you're an evil guy. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's Buddhism. Buddhism is you get what you earned in this life or the previous life. And so Buddhists can look at something just like Job's friends. They can look at someone and they can know what happened to that person. If you have a terrible accident happen to you, ah, oh, obviously you did something wrong. And if you've been a good person your whole life and followed all the precepts, you go to a monk, and the monk will do some special stuff, and he'll come up with, well, you know, three lifetimes ago, you raped a little girl. That's why this is happening to you. Uh, half a month's salary, please. Did you not? Did you not? There's, yeah, so it's a, it's a difficult, different, uh, difficult deal here. So uh, you have either bad thoughts, bad words, or bad actions of some kind. That's why you're suffering. Aches and pains, anybody? 
You know, it's karma. You did something wrong. You know, the indigestion last night. Had a had an argument with your family. You know, having financial problems. Any of these, any of these things, any of these common sufferings that we go through in life. The more that a person is suffering, obviously the worse kind of a person they are. So for a Buddhist, the reason why a Buddhist does good works is not because that person is suffering and they want to help them. The reason why a Buddhist does good works is because if they do good works, they earn more merit for themselves. It's a very different motivation. It's really fascinating to watch this. But when you're thinking about Jesus, what do we say about Jesus? Jesus did what? What's that? He died. Why did he die? What kind of a death? He died in his sleep, you know, after having a long life and has 20 kids. What kind of a death did Jesus die? The crucified. Who, cruci who gets crucified? Huh? Bad people, right? How bad a death is crucifixion? Is that like, okay, you kind of, you know, you get to go to sleep and, right? So the point here is that for a Buddhist looking at the cross, what, does, what comes into their mind about Jesus? What did he do? What, how bad a person was he? You know? He had to have been a really bad person or he wouldn't have been up there on that cross. So that's a little bit different. I've got good news for you. Jesus died for your sins. What? <laughs> that's, that's a little bit strange. One of the other contexts here is that of respect for your family. And this means a little different than what we mean in the United States. This means that, uh, ladies, I'm sorry, in Buddhism, you can't earn merit for yourself. Someone else has to do it for you. This would be your son, who you want to go into the monkhood, who can earn merit for his mom. Single ladies, you're out of luck. Um, you know, it's just a, it's just a, it's a bad deal. So, so you can get the idea that if a young man who hasn't gone into the monkhood yet, comes to Christ, his mom's looking at him like, what, you're not going to go into the monkhood for me? You know? And then you have the idea of, of spirit worship, yeah. ancestor worship. This is not just respect. And it's not just grandma and grandpa. It goes back generations, thousands of years. And someone comes to Christ. Neil and I had a taxi driver taking us to the airport. We called for a special taxi that time, and uh, he was taking us to the airport with our lots of luggage that we were going to take. And it turned out to be that he used to be a Christian. And we started talking to him, and he found out that we were missionaries. He's like, I used to be a Christian. You know, but his family had put so much pressure on him that he had come back into Buddhism. Because to be a Christian meant that you weren't participating in all these rituals that their families were participating in. And it's difficult, it's challenging. Then it's political as well. To be Thai is to be Buddhist, to be Burmese is to be Buddhist, to be Laotian is to be Buddhist, to be Khmer is to be Buddhist, to be Vietnamese, well, you're communist. But most of them are Buddhist. So becoming a Christian is not just you're going against your family. You're also going against your whole society in this thing. Wow. Folks, one of the most unreached areas in the whole world. Um, yeah. Territorial spirits. Now, this one sounds bad, but I've got good news for you. This is the easy one. <laughs> okay. All those fake movies that are all the terror movies about demon possession, let me tell you what, they are all stinking lies. This is not a problem for Christians. It is a problem for people that are not Christians because every single house, business, college, mall, you name it, they all have a spirit house, and that spirit house actually has a demon resting there that owns that place, and it's sort of like having a, a really mean motorcycle guy sitting on the, 
the side of the sidewalk saying, if you walk by and you don't pay attention to me, I'm going to smack you. Bad things will happen. And so people pay attention to these. They give them a small offering. Uh, they'll give them a why. Uh, they'll they'll uh, maybe put a little bit of food there. This one in, in the picture is one that was in a college. It was right behind our house. This is at a Caterpillar uh, location where they were selling big heavy equipment and they have a spirit house. I'll tell you folks, it's everywhere. Now, in 2002, I was in Thailand. I'd come from the Philippines for an education meeting in Thailand. And while we're having our education meeting, Sam Young Me, one of our missionaries, calls us in the education meeting. He said, look, we're trying to build this building in Metang, and we've got a problem because all the workers have stopped. They're afraid to build. The spirit has told them that if they build, he will kill them. And so would you please pray for us? Well, we stopped our education meeting. We all started praying. We prayed for a while until we prayed out pretty good. We felt the Lord had answered prayer, and we went back to our meeting. And a couple of hours later, Sam Youngmi calls us up, and he says, well, he says, things are better. The Spirit told us that the things were too hot, and he needed to leave. <laughs> and in my experience in working with people that are in this kind of situation, that's the most kind of common reaction. Folks, we have the Holy Spirit. We walk as temples of God, and these are not scary for us. But the very fact that it's not scary for us is a testimony to people. They walk in fear, and we walk in peace. And they see the peace. It's really clear. So questions, thoughts, before I head on. It's OK. I'm very interruptible. <laughs> I spent my whole early ministry doing stuff with kids who you could only ask a question and you expect them to speak up immediately without even raising their hand. So if you think of something, in other words, go ahead. We've been able to grow. Uh, the God has done something great. There's a new spirit in Southeast Asia in these last days. Um, in Cambodia, Rolf and Debbie Kleinfeld uh, went back into Cambodia after about 10 years where we were, had to be out, and they were found 15 churches that still said they were Nazarene, and those churches, and Debbie and Rolf worked and uh, mint villages, and we've grown to over 60 churches now. And the Kleinfields came home last year. The Lord had called them home from that. But they did a fantastic job of growing the church. Myanmar, from 32 to 90 churches, most of the work of Bill and Mil Kwan, um, who took over after Dr. Robin Saya finally retired. Dr. Saya had started the work at Church in Nazarene, and for 30 years, he planted about 30 churches, a pretty good work. Uh, and the Lord uh, sent Bill and Mil Kwan as part of the people we were helping to assign, and, and they were able to encourage the church to go ahead and grow. And in Bangkok, uh, we've grown, we had two churches forever and forever, and again, Bill and Mil Kwan helped us and some others, but we've been able to plant seven churches from that. So I'd like to tell you the story of Mamo. Uh, Mamo's from a little town called Mandalay. It's in central Myanmar. And she was one of our first believers in the Church of Nazarene in Myanmar. And Mamo uh, came from a really bad family. Uh, her husband, uh, drunkard, poor, her family was opposed to her. And I got involved with this because when Bill Kwan started this area in Mandalay, uh, we had pastors that were coming to us. They wanted to be ordained in the Church of Nazarene, and so we began to offer those course of study classes that we do, and I began to help teach some of those. You say, what does a field strategy coordinator do? Well, anything. <laughs> anything that needs to be done in front of them, okay? So I, I've done nearly any kind of a job inside and outside the church you can imagine. But a part of my work at this point was to teach a class so I would come every few months to teach, and Mama was there the first time we were teaching. The Buddhist, there was a Buddhist monk that met us at the airport. I don't know, that's a little bit different here. I'd never had a Buddhist monk meet me at the airport before to pick me up and take me to a uh, Bible study class for a <laughs> bunch of pastors. That was a strange deal. So this Buddhist monk meets us, and he's with the Christian pastors there, and he sits through our whole class. <laughs> 
And his one question that he had, he had several, but the big question he had was, what do you mean by love? What do you mean by love? Mama was sitting there too. And she, over the next, over the last five years, has come to every single time I was teaching except for one. So when we got done with the class, her pastor asked me to talk to her for a minute. She was wondering about what to do next. Because she's from a hard family. She's the only Christian. Not just the only Christian in her family. She's the only Christian in her neighborhood and probably for blocks around. Okay? Folks, this is being the only Christian. And so I, I told her, I said, look, I was remembering again from Peter. I said, look, don't preach to your husband. Just pray for him quietly, not, not out loud to him. But for your children, I said, pray for your children. Pray for them out loud. And when they have a problem, pray for the problem out loud. And when they're heading out of the door, pray for them as they head out the door to go to school or whatever they're going to do. And just pray for your children. And I said, the Lord will answer prayer. So I came back three months later. Or four months later, I don't remember exactly, but the next time I came back, Mama was there again, and her oldest daughter was there, who was not yet saved. But her oldest daughter was listening to his trained pastors. <laughs> and so her oldest daughter sat there and listened to this thing, and I, I, we, we went away, and I don't know what's happening. I come back the next time a few months later, and now her youngest daughter is with her because her oldest daughter had gotten saved. And so then we, she goes through the stuff that we're training. We're, we're training different stuff, and... And uh, we go through this, we get done, and I come back a few months later, and now we heard the story that Mamo's husband had come to Christ. And this man who had been a drunkard was transformed. And he heard that there were, we were going to be training pastors, and we had about 15 pastors there from all kinds of denominations, not just Nazarene. And... He says, we have to do something to help the pastors. Can you believe this? This brand new man, uh, only a Christian for a couple of weeks, and he's saying, we have to do something to help these pastors. So he had no job. What he did was he fixed up a little cart that he has. He ran around the street looking for things that he could pick up and uh, recycle. And so he, he gathers a little bit of stuff. He sells it. He gives Mamo the, the, the small amount of money. He says, here, buy some food and cook them a lunch. And she did. So we had lunch one of those days because Momo and her husband sponsored our lunch. That was a hard lunch to eat, folks. Um, yeah. You know, when you have someone who's poorer than you are that's given to you, that's, that's difficult. But God bless them. The next time I came around, their son had come to Christ, and they elected him in that meeting to become a small group leader. The next time I came around, Momo had won one of her neighbors a lady to Christ who was in exactly the same position. Her whole family was not a Christian, but she had just become a Christian. That little church, when we first started training, and the pastor who was functioning as my translator, basically it was the pastor, his family, and Mamo, and one or two others that were the church in that little church. And this last March, when we were leaving, I was there for an ordination service. We organized the district as a district in the church in Nazarene. And he received an ordination, and in his interview, as we're interviewing him, his church now has 60 people. He had six people in the course of study that he was teaching. God is building his church. And folks, you know what? You're doing that. You're doing that. It's, you don't think about this, but it's your, all those little pieces of change that you're putting in the offering plate, you're accomplishing something big. You're doing far, far more with what you have than what you think you are. So in Mandalay now, um, this is a few years ago. We actually have more churches than this now. We organized seven new churches. Uh, this man right here is Dr. Bill Kwan. Uh, his, he's a Korean and um, has done a fantastic job. A Duan is a lady who helped to start a church in her home in Thailand. And she had uh, come from our Bangkok First Church. 
and moved back home to her province. And again, almost no Christians, no church of any kind in the village, in her village or any of the villages to surround. And so uh, she was teaching in a public school, teaching English in the one that was close to her, and then also getting paid to teach in a Catholic school, teach English. And she wanted to do something. So this lady here, Tom, who's our field NYI coordinator, had invited us to come and meet with uh, Duan and her, the district superintendent, Pastor Lamp, drove Naomi and I, and we went up there to meet them. And we are listening to her and her husband. Her husband is diabetic. He's in his 40s. He's nearly dying from the diabetes. He's, he's got the blindness. He's got the, the whole deal. And, but his ministry was to people that were sick because he had such compassion for them and their sickness since he had himself been so sick. And so he was helping them. And we're sitting there and Duan saying, well, you know, the only person that's come to Jesus is my niece. And she had one other believer that was coming over. But she was discipling and preaching and talking to nearly 100 to 150 people, including most of her family. And Pastor Lamp spoke up. He says, well, we have a new definition for a church in the Church of Nazarene. He says, all you need is a group of people who gather on a a weekly basis with a defined leader that are in line with the, with the mission and message of the church in Nazarene, and you can be a church. And he looked her in the eye, and he says, do you want to be a church? And she was kind of blinking at us, and she said, yeah. She said, I like that. She, she said, okay, on the DS, you're now a church in Nazarene in, in this village. And so... Tom, who'd helped us there, began to take us back. Our vision for Southeast Asia here are these kind of churches, Acts 2, 42 to 47 churches that multiply through Southeast Asia and the world, reaching the unreached. Church of Nazarene, our mission, making Christ-like disciples in the nations. And we added a little bit here because of the difficult, dangerous places we live in, the places where people go to jail because they're Christians, that are transformed, humble, and courageous, through evangelism, education, compassion, and mentoring. And our goal was to have multiplying, fully functioning districts throughout Southeast Asia. Our region has a goal of, of helping every single Nazarene member to disciple someone as a Christian, at least one new person every four years. Anybody here know someone who's not a Christian? You know anybody that's not a Christian? I see that hand. I see that hand. Yeah, in four years of prayer and encouragement and walking with them to see them come to Christ and disciple them to do the same thing. And not just as an individual, but also as a church. And especially in Asia, where there's so many unreached areas, but Folks, I believe this can work here, too. And if we're generous with the definition of church, I've, I've been doing uh, church planting for 20 years, not myself personally, but encouraged and training it. And I've had a lot of people ask me, when do you start a new church? And my definition for that is whenever there's a barrier. If there's a barrier that people won't cross, we need to start a new church. And that barrier can be economic, it can be language, it can be that they have a different kind of a culture or attitude. You know, whenever there's a barrier and folks aren't going to come with us, it's time to start a new church. And you know who I found that God calls to be those pastors? It's people like Duan. God calls ordinary Nazarenes. I've seen more churches started by lay people going ahead and taking up that work and saying, God's calling me to do this thing. And this was an outreach of our field NYI coordinator. Uh, we've been trying to train local missionaries, and she says, I want to train cross-cultural missionaries. I said, great, go for it. We gave her a small budget, and she invited people from all over Southeast Asia. There were dozens of different cultures that came to Thailand, and they went to Duan's place and started trying to do outreaches with them. Karat Thailand, point, 
4% Christian. It means in a town the size of Benita, how big is this town? 6,000. So you'd have two Christians. Everybody else would be Buddhist. What did I do wrong? Okay, I'll keep going here. Here, go, 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 go. Okay. This young man came to that training. He's now a district superintendent in Mandalay. This was this is Smallmo's pastor. International Church, we had Korea and Cambodia was growing so fast that they had not even instituted any of these Nazarene stuff. You know, they didn't have NYI or NMI or, or any of these things, SDMI. This is not happening yet because the churches were so new. And so we had a Korean church, uh, the Gungsu Tojin Church of Nazarene, that came to Cambodia, <clears throat> paid for the whole thing, they brought people from all these little villages all over Cambodia and trained uh, the NYI in Cambodia. And that was quite a, quite a deal. You give to Alabaster. This particular training center is a district center. We built this $20,000 of your Alabaster money. And the, the day it was dedicated, we had a cross-cultural training to help send local missionaries. And a part of the people that were in that training were... Um, uh, Mamo's pastor, another leader, and some others that we sent out. From that training, they, they were able to send out uh, five young people that were in their early 20s, and they went to a really remote province that was under a civil war, and they started five new churches in one year. Chapman International. Um, for a couple of years, I was a... <laughs> I was a the Chancellor of Chapman International College for about two years. Um, when they can't find anybody else to do something, they'll give it to the person who can't say no. <laughs> so, yeah, so there you go. So when I was the Chancellor, I, we had about 150 students, which was great. And actually, at that point, we were one of the largest Nazarene training institutions for pastors in all of, of Asia Pacific, well, I had cancer, and I was wanting to give this job away anyway, and literally the week before I went into cancer surgery there in Thailand, we had a board meeting and elected Dr. Bill Kwan, the same guy that was planting churches in Mandalay, okay? We elected him as the chancellor of uh, Chapman International, and uh, he took over, and I was gone for the next year, and, he, and when I came back, he was going gangbusters. He'd already doubled to 300. And I'm sitting on the board, and the next year we come back around, and I'm helping him with different stuff, and Bill's got these ideas, and he's moving and going. And the next year I came back, and he had 600 students. The next year I came back, and we had 900 students. in 40 learning centers in seven languages. Amazing. This is another one of your alabaster investments. This is in northern Myanmar. We put almost $100,000 of work and witness and, and alabaster into this building um, to try to, to help train pastors. Here in Cambodia, we have some pastors here. Uh, in many of these, we charge a tuition, but the tuition, folks, look, let's put it this way. When you're earning as a family household income, $40 a month. The fuel that it takes to just bring the teacher there costs more money than your whole month's salary. Um, so it's expensive to do these classes and to, to get them running. And so we do have scholarship programs for those things. We've been developing resource materials. You give money for literature. The Nazarene Church has the greatest system in the whole world. I kid you not, and it's something that every church can participate in. Frank Moore, uh, doing audio, art, video translation, online ebooks. You get to Compassion Ministries. We've had uh, civil wars in some of these places. We have droughts. We have floods. We have children's ministries and centers that are going on uh, in many of our countries, all kinds of education and training and other types of things that are happening with that. Uh, 
farms. We've got a Korean missionary, um, all kinds of skills. Folks, some of the stuff that we learn as Americans, that we learn when we're 10 years old, when you're living in a remote village that you have no access to. But we found the most powerful thing that we do is pray. And I've been encouraged here in the States to see how many churches are praying. You know, and we have seen an amazing result of this. I don't have time tonight to tell you all the stories about it. But God is answering prayer. We figured out to start asking, instead of asking working witness teams, we, there are so many of these countries, we couldn't bring a working witness team to Vietnam and build anything. You know, um, you can't bring a working witness team to Laos and build anything. But we could bring teams of people that were willing to walk through neighborhoods and pray. And we've seen great success in this. God builds his church. Jesus builds his church. And he answers prayer. And these things break down these strongholds. 